Hey, action. Mal- yeah, action. Action. <laughs> okay, he so he nervous. See, this guy gets yeah, nervous. Yeah, I do actually. Yeah. So yeah, so Malik, I've only o- always known you as an investor, entrepreneur, kind of like a business guy, right? But uh, back before when you were, you know, let's go way back, right? Family life. Was your mother, you know, who was your biggest influence in terms of how you became an entrepreneur? Was it your dad or your mom or the people around you or what? Yeah, two people. Um, yeah. First was my dad. Okay. Um, ever since I've known him, he was a businessman of yeah. sorts. Um, and actually, the, the, you know, uh, he was very, op- very optimistic person. Uh, I'll give you an example. He'll sit by someone on a plane, and we'll get into a business, uh, into a discussion with them, and just on friendly terms. And the, by the time they land, they'll say, "Oh, uh, let's do a deal." Um, and you know, that's when he got his um, his first venture to career services, right? So that's my dad. Uh, my dad was a very sort of very op- optimistic person. Uh, everyone's a good person, and we can we can do we can do business together. So that w- that was one person. And I remember all my life has been. I was I was following him on on his trips. He went to France. He went to Japan. I, business I had, trips. Business trips. I followed him. He had a lot of principles, um, and uh, I remember being his um, being his uh, receptionist. In a way, I answered all his phone calls and all that, and said, "Oh, hold on a second. He's in. You know, he'll call me back and like, taking messages and so on." So I guess I've always um, I've always been in a way uh, in this sort of environment, environment where you know um, work and pleasure, uh, work and uh, personal stuff is all entwined. In, intertwined or entwined um, and uh, and you know and there's no there's blurring of lines so you know we'll go to we'll go to a, a place and, and and do business or in Singapore either, but before before going for a meeting we'll have a nice uh, we'll have a nice me- sing- uh, mirror boss right uh, before we enter the meeting and we which we, we really enjoy that that's the kind of thing the environment I had the second person is my oldest brother um, there's a big age gap between the two of us um, I'm you know there's about at least 20 21 years difference between us that's huge that's yeah, huge yeah because I'm from the sort of I guess the second wife um, ah, so, so you know um, and uh, he was the oldest from from in the family uh, from the first wife but he was um, his influence is a bit different he is um, um, his his influence was more in terms of the industriousness. Um, I think there's no harder working person that I know personally than than him. Um, even today, he's seventy four. I think yes, seventy four, and he's going you know, into the office. He leaves for the office at seven, gets back at seven. You know, um, um, and so you know, I guess that was another. You know, and he was very much a kind of like the you know, the details guy, whereas, you know, uh, as, a, as a foil to my father, who was the concept guy, the, you know, the problem solving guy, and then the details guy, who really does a detailed problem solving, and um, the details of like, you know, like, how do we get this thing? How do we get, yeah, we've got this co- career services deal, dad, thanks very much, great, well done, uh, from business development, from getting us this opportunity, but someone has to make it work and make it happen. Um, so that's, that was my oldest brother. You mentioned principles, right? Your dad, the, you know, he, he was a man of principles. What kind of principles? Sorry, I was a man of principles, principles yeah. in the other way, not L-E-S, but uh, principles as A-L-S, right? So okay. principles here, where you have principle, foreign principles. Oh, of course, of course. You're a distributor to, of some kind. Yeah, so we do some kind. Of, we, I think we were distributed in, even um, in the 70s, even to Petronas and to okay. S, uh, Exxon, Exxon and to and Shell. Um, we were, they were like drilling equipment um, that, you know, that these oil co- companies drilling in Malaysia needed. And we represented some um, principles in France, in Japan, in the US uh, to provide drilling bits. Uh, so how, to kind of how, well, how old were you at the time? I was about, maybe I was in my sort of um, 10, 11, 12 okay. uh, years okay. old. I was sitting, you know, my... So the age of uh, consciousness, right? You know, consciousness, coming yeah. To, coming to your own cognitive awareness, right? Yeah. So I was sitting in the office, um, something like this, sitting, sitting down, typing telexes. In those days, we had something called telexes. We had no faxes at the time, yeah. and typing telexes, doing quotations, and so on. I was probably like a yeah, ten year old kid, twelve year old kid doing this sort of thing. So I was an office, yeah. I was an office gopher, right? So that was that was it kept me occupied, um, kept me occupied during 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 holidays and uh, and and spare time. What kind of conversations did you guys have? Actually, it was interesting. The, the, the conversations were between my father and my brother, and I was sitting in the back oh, of the so, car. So your brother was involved in the business as well? Yes, he was. Right? So, f- well, so f- father and son, clearly, right? Father and, and son, and, and involved. yeah, and the so, kid at the so, back. Right, the kid at the back. So, <laughs> the kid at so the back. Dad was like, the ideas guy, he's yeah. the ideas guy, yeah. and then your brother was kind of the, the, the operational guy. Yeah, and I was the guy at the back listening to all this and oh, cool, kind of like cool, saying, cool, cool, cool. and bored to death at some point in time. Right, but right, but right. Some, obviously something went in here right? in, yeah, in, yeah. In, those, in those conversations, right? So I just sat at the back of the car, you know, there was, um, you know, not, there wasn't even 
little music. There was just literally just my father and my brother talking uh, about business, and there I was. Right? So, so it's just like by osmosis, or so by osmosis, yeah. And um, and it's just you know, yeah. Was like, there something romantic about the whole notion? Did you like you know the whole autonomy of, of your life, or there was something the whole, to be said for that? Un, un, unlimited revenue potential of business. No, no. What, what was that? What, what drove you? There wasn't. I mean, it was a lot of problem solving. So it, I wouldn't say okay. it was like all you know, sort of uh, all. all all roses, right? Um, a lot of problem solving. I mean, they were they went through the eighty five recession together, okay. and I was you know I was a um, I was a teenager then. Um, but but basically, it was um, you know it wasn't uh, yeah it 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 it, it was by it was by osmosis. Um, sorry, I forgot the question. Oh, my yeah, apologies. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, like, what kind of conversations? What kind of like things happen to make you so enamored by the entrepreneurial life? Oh, right? okay. So because a lot of yeah. people did, they just want the stability of a job. Yeah. And uh, the, the income, right? So the, yeah. So there was an, the element of independence. Yeah. I think that was that was that came through very very. Um, okay. Whenever you want it, however you wanted it. As yeah. In, as in, yeah. So you want to stop by for your mirrorbos before your meeting? You go for it, right? Yeah. Um, I, you know, you wanted to do a bit of shopping before you had a meet, before you met some clients. You can you can do that, right? Yeah. Um, you want to, you want a bit of unstructured time after uh, after you know after after a bus- uh, meetings and generally yeah. they were just meetings. You know, I I never saw. Well, my brother actually did the, the tenders and quotations and all that, yeah, but I, yeah. my father never really sat down and yeah, kind of like yeah, yeah. did things like that, right? Yeah, yeah. He never really did that. All he yeah. did was just have meetings, yeah. <laughs> you know? And in meetings, it's something we would have got. And, and sometimes I, I would see value being created. I remember this as a uh, I think value being created before my very eyes. You know, I'm like, um, I've seen people come in and say, you know what? Uh, we will do this where we, you know, where we buy at a certain price, and then I've already got a, I've already got a buyer that at a higher price already. So basically, my my father and this other his principal were hatching a deal where they could make, you know, just in a matter of like one meeting, yeah. uh, an arbitrage. So there's yeah. an arbitrage there. There's yeah, a margin already. There's a margin. Right? Wow, I, I was like thinking, is this how money is being made? You know, it's like, is this how money thinks? Obviously, that you know, ten, you know, nineteen times out of twenty, right? That yeah. didn't. That those yeah. meetings came up to. Nothing, right? Yeah, yeah. But maybe, maybe just that once, right? Um, that something did come out of it, right? So yeah. there was that. There was that element. There were a lot of naive stuff. I mean, I, I, I'll be, I'll be honest with you. There were a lot of naive projects and a lot of naive things that my, my but father got involved in. That's what entrepreneurs do, right? They make mistakes and then they yeah. pick themselves up and they get, get going again. I yeah. mean, that's the whole idea. Yeah. You don't um, stay down, right? Yeah. But I, there, there are times when you know we, we never did, we never really did the numbers. You know, um, yeah. we when we in, in those days, this was in the seventies and early eighties. You know, when deals come through, oh. Let's start a career. You know, um, this career service is in trouble. They need some help. If we were to help you, would you give us some equity? Sure, no problem. We'll give you equity. This, uh, and, uh, but there wasn't more like, oh, oh is, it, is it worth doing? Is so it due diligence and the due diligence analysis. Yeah, let's say, is it worth doing? Is this a big market for career services? Is it this? Is it that? Yeah, yeah, no, yeah. no such thing. Yeah, 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 yeah sure, we'll yeah, do it, and then yeah, yeah. and then figure it out. And once once you got the kind of yeah, we like you as partners. You solve yeah, our problem. Yeah. Uh, uh, now let's do the numbers. Ah, okay, let's do the numbers <laughs> now, right? Uh, my father was offered um, again. The, my father was offered. The um, the franchise to do um, the courier services in uh, Saudi Arabia, yeah. and he just went. That's huge. Yeah, that and he huge. just went. Uh, okay, I'll do it because you know he did. I mean, yeah. he did. He saw a problem in in yeah. in, in, Ke- in Malaysia, yeah. and it was offered the franchise in Saudi Arabia. And like my dad goes, okay, that's interesting. I like to do my Hajj and my Umrah and all that. Yeah. I'll I'll do it. In Saudi- I'll take the franchise to Saudi Arabia. Oh, here's the amount to do it. Um, okay, I'll put I'll put in the capital to do it as well. Yeah. So yeah. he did it. He became an. Uh, he became a. You know, this is in the early '80s, um, uh, sort of a franchisee of uh, a courier service in, um, in 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 Saudi, and he was. Uh, yeah, I remember he told telling me, um, you know, Malik, I know, I wasn't with him at the time. I was in school, but he said, you know, I, I know our first year of operations, I was, I was literally delivering the parcels by myself in Saudi. You don't have road, you don't have addresses, and you don't have numbers. You just we're just driving blindly. Right? So, these are. You know, um, um, fantastic stories that I yeah. heard, and, and it's you know, it, it gives you. So it's it was never, you know, business was never about really about uh, numbers in those days, right? It was all about Just is there an opportunity? Yeah, yeah, and and you know, is it a good opportunity? Does it sound quite good? Yeah, fine. But that got us some. That got us some great wins, but yeah. there also some great losses, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, some some things you go into and your eyes are. And in front of you know much more experience or or people who are out to get you or are out to con you, yeah, you get you get hosed pretty badly. Yeah, so I mean, just jumping forward now, mm. right, when you look at a new business, and obviously you're much more of a numbers guy um, versus. So how much, how much emphasis should you play on put on numbers, and how much emphasis should you put on on gut feel? Because a lot of the old timers 
they put a lot of emphasis on the way they feel about the business. Mm. They don't do any analysis, right? Especially the China, the Chinaman entrepreneurs. They just have a gut feel. Mm. Are you a gut feel guy or a numbers guy? Which I'm both. One is? Yeah. I'm both. Yeah. I start off with gut feel. Yeah. Okay. Right. So, do you want to do radio? Do you want to do uh, uh, online insurance? Right. Yeah. Gut feel. Gut feel yeah. first. Gut feel first. Gut feel first. Almost and always. But before I sign on a dotted line, you look at the numbers. Look at the numbers. So, if you're yeah. if you're a budding entrepreneur, how would you convey gut feel? What What is gut feel? So, to a certain extent, it's a sense of um, it's a sense of whether the product you're trying to introduce or service you're trying trying to introduce. Yeah. Are you solving a problem, a real problem, not a problem of your own figment of imagination? Uh, or your own personal individual okay, so problem. Okay, so it always starts with a problem and yeah. an yeah. omission in the industry. Yes, that's Or right. like an imbalanced industry. Yes. So okay. look at radio, for example. Right? Okay. Is there a problem? There was a problem in radio at the time. All the all the all the formats of radio were geared towards entertainment and to a lot. Well, a lot of people say to me trivial stuff. Yeah. Yeah. You're sitting in the road, you know, two hours a day, and all you're listening is gotcha calls and and people cackling away, right? Uh, laughing at their own jokes. And that was a real problem because yeah. people were get, people like yourself were yeah. getting bored. Yeah, no and question. Like, and, and, and you know, iPods were coming and people saying I was switching off to, to listen yeah. to my yeah. podcast even yeah. those days, right? So there is a problem to be solved. The problem yeah. was well, there was a, nothing substantive. So then came you know, the kind of like, all right, I can provide something substantive. I have yeah. a concept here that can provide something substantive. Yeah. Do the numbers work yeah. after that, right? So, yeah. you know, so first get the feedback on whether feedback on whether it is something that people want, right? Yeah. And then the the answer was, the answer was maybe if it's not too boring, right? That was the feedback that I got. It could yeah. be dry, Malik. That's yeah. my only. The people yeah. who objected to it objected to the fact that it could be dry. Right? How Where, much? Mm-hmm. And then how much crowdsourcing in terms of opinions do you get? You know, you know how sometimes there's an analysis paralysis, right? Yeah, of course. You have too much, you have too much comments, and you don't know whether you're coming or going. Yep. Right, and some people they just move. They, yep. they don't care too much. You know, Steve Steve Jobs was a bit like that, right? Mm. He just whatever he felt, he just did it. Yep. Um, well, so well, for me, there is an element that the feedback loop is important, right? But it doesn't dominate. Meaning, okay. So there is a there is a sense like okay. okay. So I, I like to go. I like to peel the onion a little bit more. Where I hear people give me feedback. Okay. Right? So they say, oh no no, business won't work. So do you stop there? No, I peel the onion. Why why do you say that business won't work? And, and the kind of things I'm I'm looking for. I'm looking for adjectives that they are they are saying back to me and the yeah. adjectives that came back was boring okay right so okay. those are the things that I look for I look yeah. for adjectives okay boring it's uh, dry this so like ah okay now now I understand I, it's not so much that it's business but it's because it's it, not entertainment it's not entertainment it's yeah. dry it's boring so if I were to do business I need to make sure that is not dry, it's not boring, yeah. and there's an entertainment, there's a slight entertainment slash yeah. um, something else that okay. makes it, ele- ele- elevates it from being dry and boring. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So like, it's likewise with um, online insurance, which I'm involved in now, right? yeah. again, yeah. What, what's, what's the problem? The problem is the products are, the, the, the margins are nuts. It's, it's, it's not, it's not Nuts good or nuts bad? No, it's, it's unconscionable, right? Nuts to good. Me, unconscionable, nuts yes. Nuts unconscionably good. Uh, yeah, unconscionably good for people who are, you know, who are aging Agents, right, and that's fine because yeah. the agents are. They always say insurance is is sold and not bought. So therefore, to reward the fact that you're selling something which is quite complex, yeah, or or needlessly complex, yeah, um, that you when you're selling this, you have a lot of you know you have to persuade someone to sign a dotted line to a commitment for like 15, 20 years. Yeah, that you you know you pay them a, a, an immense margin yeah. to achieve that, right? Yeah. And industry margins are about over the life of the policy is about one hundred eighty percent of premiums in, yeah. in, in yeah. life insurance, right? One hundred eighty percent of premium uh, right. annual premiums. So, but in the insurance industry, that's seen as that's that's fair reward because it's so hard to persuade people. But how? It's about, not really though. But how, yeah. yeah. But how about persuading people through another method? Yeah. Persuading people through not selling, but yeah. through marketing, through yeah. through through um, product. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. How about selling a simpler product? Don't yeah. sell the complex complex stuff. Yeah. yeah. How about taking a more uh, a, 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 a smaller margin on these things, yeah. right? And, but get the, leave, leave a lot of money on the table for the consumer. Yeah. Yeah. So, is there a problem? Yes, there is a problem. What people are saying is that insurance is complicated. It doesn't have to be. Yeah. Um, what people are saying is, I don't. Two thirds of people do not want to see agents. Why? Because they feel pressured. Yeah. Uh, they feel pressured. They feel that they're being sold, right? So it doesn't have to be. So there is a problem. Then I go back. And say, then I look at the numbers and say, all right, now there is a problem to be solved. Mm. Um, there is a gut feel here, but does, do the numbers work out? And the numbers work out, 
okay, let's go for it. You know, workout meaning yeah. it doesn't have to be like, wow, it has to be a, a slam dunk. No, yeah. it has to be a, 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 a good, um, you know, a, there's a good, good, good attempt. If you can get to it, it's a decent return. If, if there's a good attempt, that's fine. Let's go for it. So the starting point is always the, um, the noticing of an omission or like a, a imbalance in industry which you think can be corrected. Yeah. And then beyond that, the gut field and then of course a bit of analysis, yeah. a bit of crowdsourcing for, for feedback and yeah. then the, the courage to go for it, right? Yeah. So yeah. I know of you um, because you, 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 I think you did law and then you went and joined the corporate sector, you did a bit of Maxis, you did a bit of Job Street, you did a bit of Boston Consulting, um, high income jobs, right? So first of all, um, how did you muster up the courage to leave a well paying job to go into the unknown world, the murky world of entrepreneurship? And in the first place, how much um, of a of an obstacle was the lack of capital because I'm I'm, I'm assuming you're not a money you're not a mm. you're not from an upper middle class like wealthy you know millionaire background right mm. right yeah so yeah it was a leap it was it yeah. was coming I mean because right. courage a lot of people the people get stopped out of courage they yeah. don't have the balls to do it right no yeah. yeah so first I guess um, uh, I, I I was in my early thirties right yeah. And when you're in your early thirties, anything know, possible. It's anything's possible, right? You don't you don't think about the consequences. Right? Yeah. You're like, um, you you, there's there's not enough fear uh, around a thirty a thirty something. Were you uh, married by then? Sorry. Yes, yeah. I was married by then. Yeah. Children by then? No. Right? Okay, so that's yeah. a good thing, right? It's a good thing. I mean, at least in terms of perspective of not having right. the fear. Yeah, in terms of not having too many dependents on yeah, you. Too many, yeah, that's right. So, so you know, when we're, you, you remember when we were in our 30s, right? We're just like, you know, fearless, right? Yeah. Just go for it, grow yeah. things like that, right? And then... Yeah. Answer's always yes, there's yeah. never no. Right? Yes. Yeah. And then, you know, and then over time, then you, you know, wisdom comes and then you like go, oh, shoot, you know, I, did, I went in there without even da 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 Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. But I think, but still there are people who do not do that, who don't take the leap even at that, at that time when you're comfortable, you have things. I think the biggest thing I've learned um, over time is don't let lifestyle catch up with you. Don't let your, your, the expenses of your lifestyle sort of, you know, sort of in a way be, go in tandem with your income. Because yeah. then if that's the case, it's really hard to go back to entrepreneurship. You're an investment banker, you're earning 40,000 ringgit a month. Your expenses are 35,000 ringgit. To go entrepreneurship, you have to go, do, go back down to 15 or 10. Yeah. Right? Which are you able to do that? Yeah. You can't. That, I think that's the tough part. If and that, that's the thing I've learned is that once you let your lifestyle catch up with you, then you then you're then, then it's really hard to make this decision, right? So um, I my whether I was fortunate or not unfortunate, I had this this uh, I shifted at a very early age, right? So yeah. you know, I was in my early thirties, I left a good paying job of Boston Consulting Group earning 20 K something a month. And um, that is still a time, huge salary till yeah, today. At the time, and you know, and then when I went into I, you know, I when I went into this, my salary was probably about ten thousand or something like that. I know yeah, it still got a salary um, from from the capital I raised, um, but but then you know I learned very early uh, at that stage when I shifted to my first job, the, my first entrepreneurial gig, that my lifestyle um, had to adjust. Right, so that was the adjustment happened at a very very early stage, and then I joined, and then you know that that my first venture didn't pan out. Joined Job Street under Mark, someone called Mark Chang, and of Job Street fame. Of Job Street fame, and you know, and if He's you know, out, uh, and if you know, if you know what Mark Chang is like in terms of with money, you learn very, very quickly that my gosh, you know, if you're talking about managing your lifestyle, so you don't, it doesn't catch up. Mark is the, you know, the, the doyen of that, the right? <laughs> of that, so you learn pretty quickly, yeah, yeah how to yeah. sort of you know make sure that that that's the case, right? Even so, today, my wife is like saying, you know what, like you you. Uh, we're, we're okay now, you know, you can, you can, you can buy something for yourself, you yeah. know, it's alright, you can buy a nice car if you want to, I'm like, yeah. no, 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 kind of so. There's a life lesson there, Malik, yeah. because until today I know you as a simple guy, you don't have a nice watch, I don't think you even have a car in Malaysia, you don't, no, I don't. you don't have a car, yeah. you grab it everywhere, um, I think, you know, I asked you this before, your only extravagance is your smartwatch because it, 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 it gives you some kind of value in terms of how much exercise you do, hmm. and that's about it, and your devices, but but your devices make you uh, more productive. Yeah, they're not that expensive. It'll be just about yeah, you know, yeah. So, so even then, even then, or something like that, right? So, so there's a life lesson there. So austerity is one thing. Keeping control of your of your habits is another. For the entrepreneur, how important is that? So um, I think one thing that I've learned as I got older yeah. is that. And, and at what point in time does it become counterproductive? Because you can be the stingy, miserly old guy yeah. who's worth a few hundred million, mm. but then doesn't spend his money. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So yeah. it depends what you want. I mean, it really depends on the person, right? Some people yeah. like cigars. I don't, so I don't smoke. 
So, I, so then why do you make money? What, what is the raison d'etre for that? I don't know. I'm, I'm um, maybe... Not necessarily you, but as a yeah. psychoanalytical um, dilemma, yeah. why do people work so hard with the business and, they, and get as rich as they do and then be complete mis- misers about it? No, I, I wouldn't say I, I'm... Not, not that you are, yeah, but, yeah. but there's, a, there's this interesting I, case study here. So for me, the psychoanalytic stuff is basically I want to provide for my family the best way I can, right? So having reserves, a cash balance that I can sort of... Um, I can sort of you know bequeath, uh, make sure that they're okay and so on. Not necessarily bequeath, but you know, but make sure that they're okay and, uh, and be able to like sort of say, all right, you know, I can provide for them until they're eighteen or twenty-one, even. I mean, you know, when, when they go to university, that is a big, huge motivator, right? Yeah. And that's not necessarily being miserly. That's just being, being just like being a uh, being a responsible, father, right? yeah, being, being a responsible father. parent, right? So, do I need? Uh, I do not need. For some reason, I I have never had an affinity towards. Um, um, this brands being you know, being marketed to us all the time, right? I have never affinity for watches. I don't have affinity for pens, um, even fa- even fancy cars. I never, yeah. no affinity for those things. I know, what, tra- yeah. I, th- I know what turns you on. I know business turns you on. I know investments turn you on. I know analyzing stocks turns you on, yeah. which is quite geeky, but it's quite cool in a way. Yeah. Well, I, I like I like to, uh, nothing get, gets a better feeling. Yeah. Um, it, it's, it's like, um, it's like when you buy a stock at X and you, you know, and it's now at eight X. That's a yeah. nice feeling, right? Yeah, that's it's, a really good fix, right? Yeah, yeah, and and that's why I aim for. And it's the same feeling as I'll tell you what is the same feeling. It's the same feeling when I grow a plant, yeah. and the plant comes up with seeds, and I I, I take six pots from Sungai Bulo in those days, six seven pots where yeah. I plant those seeds. I get yeah. six plants, yeah. right? Yeah. And when I left my home, this you know, although each plant you know I can sell, I, I sold it actually yeah. for yeah. 40, 50 ringgit each. Yeah. But the satisfaction. From knowing that from one plant, you can get six plants yeah. and sell it at you know the price that you bought it at. It, it's a it's it's not it's not monetary. It's just yeah. more that satisfying feeling that money grows on trees, right? That's yeah, like yeah. or you buy a stock that is quite you know, X and then it goes to six X, eight X, ten X. You're like, yes, I made a right call. Yeah. And 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 you know and I don't have to um, have a sleepless night over it, right? Yeah. So that's a big. Uh, it's not pecuniary. It's it's just a satisfaction of knowing that your bet your bet was right. There's something Darwinian about that. I'm not I'm not exactly sure what they, what term they call it, but it's quite it's quite evolutionary. It's quite um, I don't know. It's, it's quite uh, ancient in that respect, right? Yeah. It's to be proven right. Things, yeah. I don't to know. be to proven be right. right. So, yeah, so the self the affirming that feeling of affirmation. Yeah. In terms of what you've done and how much brain yeah. power you put into it, how much effort. Yeah. Then it comes out yeah. with reward, right? Yeah. So so BFM is like that, right? Yeah. So so, so, so business is like that. Business yeah. you plant seeds and it comes out. Yeah. And the, the naysayers side. and you like the naysayers of business is drive money. Don't do this. Do something else. Do yeah. something something yeah. simpler. Yeah. Do do a Chinese radio station. Do yeah. this. Do that. Like no, I want to do this, right? Because there is a there is a there is a national agenda as well to it. And then when you kind of when you bring a product to market and you're proven right, yeah. it's a it's a it's a it's something you can't quantify. Like yeah. yes, you know, I I, I had a hunch, yeah. uh, I tried to validate that hunch, but you never can be sure. And then you put yeah. it to market, and then suddenly it gets accepted. Yeah. Yes, you yeah. know, like yeah. yes, people like it, right? There's so, something fantastic about that. Right? Yeah, something nice yeah. feeling about it. So now it's online insurance. Let's see, right? So I'm going to do that and see. If this is a hunch. It doesn't sound that. Da, 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 da. Yeah. So um, I had a hunch about my first venture, which was KL Classified. So it was a classified paper. Um, and the idea was, you know, whilst waiting for internet to catch up, we do a classifieds paper first, right? Basically, you, all your classifieds, you know, what you know, and you, you put it on. Um, and but you know that hunch, uh, that hunch, I was so unsatisfying because I never saw to the end of that, right? Yeah. Because the Asian financial crisis came, I could never, I could never tell until today. Was it because of the product? Was it because of Asian financial crisis? Right? Well, I'll tell you the answer now because um, you're ahead of your time because John Medeski, he came in. He, he comes in and he's what he, he's a billionaire, right? Yep. Reading Football Club chairman. He mm-hmm. comes in. He does Motor Trader. Yep. He does it and does it really well. Yep. Churns money like it's going out of fashion. Yep. And then just before the um, the second financial, just before the dot com crash, he gets out, sells it to the Japanese for 200 million bucks, mm-hmm. ring it. Mm-hmm. And then Bob's your uncle because mm. after that the whole ca- the, the whole print classified business goes down the yeah. drain. Yep, <laughs> it's yeah, crazy. Exactly. So general, interestingly, John Medeski. John yeah, Medeski, yeah. He made an offer for for my first venture. Yeah, yeah. classified. Yeah. Silla, yeah la. So and, and you silly walked. Me, I yeah. walked, unfortunately. Hmm. I should have just said yes, but he was going to be a tough negotiator anyway. He was going to be a real yeah. asshole. To <laughs> he, yeah. Right. Yeah. He uh, f he f had blinded me for you know for doing something that you know yeah. accused me of something something. That, but it's okay. It's, it's that's that's you know. 
know, the, we call them the M25 entrepreneurs, right? You which, understand the expression. Which, the M25 around, around, oh, yeah, yeah, around, yeah, around circular, London, right? right? Yeah. So basically you see all those in that industrial belt, right? So yeah, yeah, he's, yeah. Uh, yeah, he's one of those that, he came from a sales, yeah. rough sales yeah. line, so yeah, he goes for it. Just say going into your um, fatherhood hat now, right, mm. Mane? Because um, I think a lot of traditional Asian entrepreneurs want to bequeath something for their children, want to sort them out. <clears throat> but then equally, there's a point of view that uh, you sh- one shouldn't um, mm. bequeath too much to, to one's children. One shouldn't give them too much of a nest egg, not even give them the feeling that they are sorted out because they might turn out to be quite... Mm. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. If they don't turn out right, it can be... And negatively yes. uh, correlated. Yep. Do you know what I mean? Because yep. they, they grow up spoiled and, and they feel entitled. Yeah. They, they don't work hard. Yep. So how do you handle that? Because they can tell that you're doing all right now, right? Yeah. I struggle with that, right? Yeah. So I, I struggle with it. But all I can say now is that um, at where we are right now, yeah. um, they would I still have to have put, put their own blood, sweat and tears. Um, so how do you so, convey, what kind of conversations do you have with your kids? So the conversation I have, I have is like, you know, you're basically, yeah, you have to, it, it's based on your own merit. Um, you, this is it's not about, you know, there's, there's no trust fund here. Right. Um, so what do you dad, do with their money? I dad, mean, what, dad, what do you tell them? Well, what I tell them, what I do is that uh, might be different things. Yeah. But what I would do as a father, what yeah. I would do is this. I remembered, right? Um, what I would do is this. And that's what happened to me as well. Um, you know, I I would make sure that education is okay. No problems at okay. all. You know, so you how, give them I, the uh, base, yeah? Base, however far you want to go. It's not, you know, so for example, yeah, I want to do I want to do a first degree. Then I want to do a master's, right? Um I'll, I'll support it all the way, right? As, as far as I can. Um, secondly, um, unless you were like one of those serial, you know, serial uh, academic, right? Yeah. They were like, you know, hang on a second, like this, <laughs> yeah. uh, get a job, um, get a real job. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, get a job, even in academia, no problem, but get a job, right? Yeah. Don't just study all your life. Um, but the second thing I'll do in this sort of very high, you know, very, you, you know, how hard it is to get on the, to have a, uh, to have a roof over your own heads, right? Yeah. Um, I would, I would. Uh, would yeah. you support the down payment? You support the down you payment. Down, right? yeah, I, I would okay. support the down At least you know no, you, you you take care of the. You got to take care. Of, you have to have your own responsibility. Your own respons- your responsibility is to buy, you know, to pay the installments and all that. But down payment, given the the state of the market it is, and I feel very I feel very hard for people who can't do this. Yes, um, I'll help you with the down payment. You know, you can pay me back later or something. You don't have you know, but, but that's my gift, right? Yeah. Then it's yeah. up to you to take it on from there. Yeah. So that's the kind of balance, that I guess always looking at right and then and then when you say what about what about what if there was anything left over after you know, to, to bequeath after that Correct. I quite like Mark Chang I spoke to Mark Chang about this yeah, a little bit yeah, right? he goes yeah. I'll live like this very hard like, you know, I wouldn't give a single cent yeah. maybe I'll consider so he, he's on the same ilk yeah, yeah he's on the same he, yeah. he says maybe you know maybe I'll put a sum aside on, uh, to, to bequeath to them when they're 50 years old right that's interesting that's interesting you bequeath yeah. to them 50 years old that means you bequeath a certain sum when you're 50 years old because if you haven't made it by then, right? You'll never buddy. You never really gonna make it. Yeah. But here's something just to make you live for yeah. you know, something that you can live on for the rest of your life, right? Or by the time you, you're doing something with your life, you've okay, great, that's a nice bonus. If you've made it, uh, that's a nice bonus. Thanks, Dad, kind yeah. of thing, right? So it's interesting. I'm still toying with the idea. I'm not sure yeah. whether I like it one way or the other, but giving someone something at twenty five years twenty five years old something, nah. No, yeah. that's that's well, not that's not it's not a it's not a right. You know? And yeah. and I think a lot of it is not so much I think it's to inculcate that yeah. uh, in them. Um, um, so, at what a young kind of age. things do you tell them? What kind of like subtle nuances or what kind of subtle messages? How do they see you behave on a day to day basis? Are you constantly so, working? So what they kind of things do you tell them? So, they don't see me spend a lot. They, yeah. Sorry, they don't see okay. me spend. Okay. Right? So, there's, a, there's some austerity about you? Yeah, okay. it's austerity. You know, every time they buy something okay. and they, they put it on the. So, you're watching, you're watching. So, they're yeah, learning um, from that. Watching. In supermarkets, when you're, when you're buying something and they okay. come back and say, Yeah, I'd like to buy this. And then uh, and they'll ask, How much? And they'll go, I don't know. I say, Well, you know what to do. So, they go off. They Fantastic. Come back, okay. They come back. And then, if it's like more than what I think it's worth, and I, I, let's say, so that's a bit expensive. Okay. Your, okay. your budget is $2. Okay. And they go, oh, okay, this three fifty. Okay, I'll go find something for two dollars. Okay. And they go off, right? Okay. Um, in their daily expenses, I guess I give them an allowance of a, uh, uh, you know what? We we work together to in terms of like saying, okay, how much will you need a week? All right. Here's here's how much I need. I need that. Okay. Here's and then what about you know what about uh, you know contingencies? Okay. Here's 
another five dollars for contingency. Okay, fine. This is what you do a week. You stick with that. You stick yeah. with that budget. Something extra special, like you know, you have a you have a, uh, you have a school trip and you want to buy extra lunch. No problem. Then we can I can top it up and so on every now yeah. and then. But yeah. otherwise, it's all within this budget. So everyone has a has a budget, and it's interesting. Money money habits already sort of I can tell already the the propensity of different children to money how they look at money you know i have one one child who literally uh, every week the, the bank account is almost zero the uh, one child the bank account is never touched you know and basically he just you know he just takes food from the from the food from the house and eats at school another child is halfway in between sometimes yeah. you know uh, takes food from home but also likes the occasional treat for himself by going to the uh, um, uh, going to, going to the shopping center and have has his favorite ramen you know so I, I, it's really interesting to see to see the different spending habits of the different children. So the kid was a bit more of a spender. Yeah. Do you spend more time with him? Um, I do you try and you know try to mm. inculcate more of those values. So I, I, I yeah. So that is my. Do you take him this, aside and, say, and whisper that, in his ear and, and say that things? is my project right now. Yeah. That yeah. is my project. Yeah. 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 That is our project. My wife and I. That's yeah. interesting. Yeah. So the, the wife and all this, right? Yep. She must she must be very supportive because you have sacrificed so much for the business. Mm. You don't live at home. I mean, I think Monday to Friday you're away because mm. I think they live in Singapore. Yep. So the path of a journey, the path of an entrepreneur is one that is fraught with sacrifices. Mm. And you basically made the decision to put your family in Singapore, where it's much more stable politically, um, much safer from a you know from a burglary perspective, to do your business in Asia, in Malaysia, where it's maybe a bit more high growth, but a bit more kamoi as well, right? Mm. Um, so how does the wife sit in this equation? The whole because there's this fatherhood, mm. right, and then there's parenthood, and then there's your your dad above, which you talked about, but then it's also your wife, the the mm. the partner in all this. Yeah. Um. It's it's nuance, right? So yeah. I mean, the fact that you're not around, yeah, uh, for so she's cool with that, right? Um, not initially, right? Because okay. she had career. to give up a career. Well, um, she was not so much giving up a career, but more towards not being there, right? When you we, not being there, not me not being there, yeah, yeah, yeah. For you know, sort of, I remember my my youngest was born two thousand seven. I started there yeah. in two thousand eight. Yeah, right. It's so, been a good ten years, more yeah, than ten years. Yeah. So my 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 third child, then basically I only saw him during weekends, right? Um, yeah. So that was, and I wasn't around Monday to Fridays. You know, now it's only you know now I'm around you know sort of you know Tuesday to Fridays, but still at the time. So I think there was a period where I think there was some resentment at the fact that I'm in KL, yeah, um, doing you know doing business and and, and yeah. so on. Yeah. Yet I'm not fulfilling in a way some part of my uh, part of my parental responsibilities right in terms of like just being there you know it's not things are not so you can't so you know parenthood is not but you can't compartmentalize it to say you know what oh you know um, things that uh, things only happen when you know during you know during during the weekends no things happen all the time you know emergencies happen here and there right and she's around. solo fending it all off yeah that's right so I think there was there's that element of uh, there's an element of resentment for that right so which we have to resolve Resolve, la, we, we think so yeah. one way one way of resolving it for me for me was well, there was a point in time where my weekend basically was I was I was the kind of like you know I said okay right um, I'll take over the kids for yeah. the whole weekend yeah from uh, from sunrise to sunset right so yeah. that's that that was me so I, yeah. I took the three kids um, you know sort of do activities a weekend my wife didn't have to do anything over the weekend yeah um, so that was one way of compromising um, and that's one way. But after a while, it, be, it became a little bit more, it became easier because the kids grew up a little bit more. They became a bit more routine. Now I'm not sure whether, yeah. uh, now I'm not sure whether my wife likes me when I'm back home during weekdays. <laughs> yeah. She's like, no, why did you just stay there? I think yeah. I'm, I'm, I have my routine now and yeah. so on. So now we, it's kind of like ingrained, right? Yeah. But the initial stages when we had young children, um, th- um, you know, sort of, especially when my youngest was just born, that was a, yeah. bit, that was a bit tough on everyone. That was a bit tough on everyone. Yeah, so a lot of sacrifices, Malik, you know, from, 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 and I know you're not the kind, but f- for a normal person, sacrificing one's lifestyle, sacrificing one's um, time with children, sacrificing one's um, you know, career prospects, real or imagined, right? Uh, sacrificing one's time with, with spouse. Hmm. It's a huge sacrifice. And a lot of people don't realize that the entrepreneurship comes with a whole bunch of sacrifices because mm. people see the success stories, they mm. see the money, they see the, the glamour, they see the private jets, but they don't see the, the tough side of it. Mm. Do, you think, do you think more um, you know, more awareness or, or more, more of a reality check should be in place? Uh-huh. 
No? That's fine. You know, People you... should just do it anyway. Yeah, I think... You on, know, on, on the balance yeah. of everything, all the conveniences. Yeah, on the balance of everything, right? So you're always working for, you know, you're, at the end of the day, you're working for, the, you know, working for yourself, you're working for the family, yeah. right? Yeah. So you're trying to create a better future for everyone, right? Yeah. So in a way, you know, it's... Um, uh, you know, what's the ideal scenario? The ideal scenario is, um, you know, one one is a one gives you this one one spouse gives you a stable income. The yeah. other one goes for the option value, right? Yeah, right. The entrepreneur stuff, that's right? right? So that's that's, right. that's the ideal scenario. Yeah. But yeah. hey, you know, when you have kids, that's not necessarily yeah. maybe going to be the case, right? Yeah. Um, so you just have to figure figure it out. Like for me, um, I know that I cannot be an investment banker. I cannot yeah. be. Uh, a lawyer. I can't sit down there and you know, and I can't play corporate games. I, you know, I, I. You can't do those things because you don't. Um, I just don't. You know, life is too short. Uh, yeah, you wanna, you wanna scratch that itch. You wanna no, see whether your so intuition is correct. That, no, it's just that I think you know, in the in the corporate world, a lot of people do not because it's good for the company. You know, but you know we talk okay. about this. Way. Okay, the, so the, the best interest of shareholders, best interest of the company. No, that's bullshit. Do, bullshit. It's bullshit. People do okay. invest best interest in their own careers. That's right. Right. Your, your, your All the shareholders. Huh? All the shareholders. Well, actually, no. But yeah. there's there's, a, there's an agency problem between shareholders and managers, right? Okay. Managers do it before for their own careers, okay. right, and their own okay. stock options. Right, um, shareholders do it. Uh, shareholders want the best best returns and so on. And then you have an employee group as well. So everyone squeezes employees. Um, you know, um, man- manager squeezes employees so they can yeah. get better. So, so it's a very, to me, you, there's a lot of corporate games. And I, I don't like working for people who really are not who do not have the best interests of their people of their people or their company in that sense. You know, they're only they're only out, out in it for themselves. And that's. This, that's what the word politics come in, right? And I, when I see that, I see, and I can I can smell it from a mile away. When someone's doing something just to further their own career, I'm like, you know what? I mm. I have I have more dignity than that to work for your career, yeah, right? I yeah. want to work for something higher, a higher, a higher, a higher purpose than that, right? So, so, to what extent should a business or the business that you choose to do have a higher purpose? Or, or have a common good or like a win-win for the environment, for the people, because that's what business is today. It's mm. evolved along a, a great deal so from the I'll 70s. Give you, I'll, I'll give you a, a simple example of a company that um, that <coughs> could have had a higher purpose, right? Or, or a short example, example of a manager who had a higher purpose. Um, there was this lady called Sue Decker, right? I was okay. working for Yahoo at the time. Yeah, yeah the she lo- was the one of the early fem- female CEOs of a dot-com. CFO. Susan Decker, right? She was CFO of Yahoo. Okay. Yeah, she wasn't a CEO. Okay. okay. Um, she was CFO at the time when I when I was at Yahoo in Singapore. Yeah. Now the country management uh, of of Singapore was just sales driven. It's like numbers, numbers, numbers. Even your product guys, right, trying to build products. It's like how can you build products that generate money today? Because yeah. and I'm like, wow, so such a emphasis on numbers. Why? Because the country manages n- n- the country's manager's remuneration is based on sales and sales numbers. Oh, so every right? single product no wonder. had to generate numbers, right? So I was like running around telcos trying to do this uh, mobile, pro- trying to do mobile product, download games, download this. Why? To to make sure that the local managers met, meet their numbers. So I felt that I was being part of someone's trying to you know burnish someone's career, right? Yeah. And remuneration. Yeah. Right? Contrast that. that. So I thought this was the culture. Then Sue Decker came uh, from Sunnyvale yeah. and came visited Singapore. And she came for a, a, a town hall and a meeting. I remember that meeting. I was like, so I sat down and I was half expecting her to kind of like say, what are the numbers for this quarter? What are number? We want you to achieve these numbers for the year in terms of sales and dollars and cents. Instead, she turned around and said something like, when someone asked a question about the numbers, um, what about sales we had to achieve and so on, she says, Hey, that's not. Don't worry about that. That's my job. Wall Street and their expectations and what numbers we achieve. That's my job. Your job is to make sure that we have great products that that we can that will generate users and 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 um, and stickiness and so on. That will happen in five years, right? That's your job. Your job is a five-year horizon, ten-year horizon. Build us those products, right? Let me worry about. Let me worry about the dollar numbers. So was there a lesson to be learned for the budding entrepreneur there? Huge it, it, lesson. Yeah. Huge lesson. The huge lesson is that you know there are there are different stakeholders, right? And and but to build for some companies, I mean, to me, even the, in today's age, product is a key. The the biggest success factor is the product. You know, Yahoo did not have a great product at the time. We had search, but it it, it comp- pale in comparison to Google, right? Um, we had banner advertising, but that was people preferred search, 
Right? Yeah. So, um, and then so there was email that was buggy and slow, buggy and full yeah. of full of uh, spam. Yeah. Clearly. So, I think so. Our job was to to either repair or build future products on that, right? Yeah. But in a way, I guess what I'm trying to say is that the the local management was very geared towards your own careers and your own remuneration, right? So this is where I find in corporates that if you really, you know, I I you there's this. Uh, there's this disconnect between sort of what what is in the best interests of the company, the shareholders, and employees, and uh, and the best interests of people running those companies. Sometimes, yeah. you know, basically, because you are working actually for people's careers, you're not actually working for the bad company's best interests. So, on to the subject of of the business that you run. I mean, your main business remains BFM, the radio station, right? For now. Um, for now. For now. Um, no long, although I'm no longer in sort of correct, day-to-day, management, day-to-day management. When it comes to managing people, what do you find is the most important thing for them? And this is quite a, again, a, a quite a intellectually uh, uh, thorny question because intuitively you would say it's salary, right? Remuneration. But it's not always. So in your experience, what drives people to do as best as they can? I think if, and I, I think suddenly for when I, I'm putting myself back time in, in terms of being an employee, employee mm. is working for, working for great bosses, that's one, and surrounded by great people, right? I'm, I'm very motivated by the person I work for. Um, if, they exhibit, you know, if they exhibit qualities that I would like to learn, um, I like to emulate, something, emulate perhaps, then I'll do that. I mean, those are the kind of, you know, those, I love working for great bosses. Um, and what I are love some of the qualities that you look for? Um, some of the qualities, um, sort of, in a way, humility, um, be, being open to So ideas. humility as your first answer is quite interesting because some people might say, oh, intelligence or wisdom or experience or knowledge. But you say humility, why? One of them. I mean, not necessarily the highest. No, not yeah. like another one is, for example, um, just being, you know, maybe the biggest, the biggest one for me is yeah. um, the ability to Listen. Yeah. I mean, yeah. not just listen. Okay. Listen. Yeah. Peel the onion and listen, yeah. you know? And I think that's a quality of great, great uh, managers. They listen. They, um, before they, they, they don't jump to conclusions, um, you know, they kind of like sit down and they kind of like listen to what you're trying to say. Customers are saying this. They listen, and then you can tell how well they listen by this saying, okay, did the, customer lis- uh, did the customer say this because of this? The customer list say this because of that. They go into details and they try to peel the onion. They try to find the adjectives I mentioned about. What are the adjectives that describe our product? What is the adjective that describe that? Or, you know, that kind of thing. So I think those are the, the biggest quality of any leader to me is the ability to listen. Of course, it's after some point, you are so far removed from the action, right? That the only yeah. way that you can fix Feel, feel the feels either you know, it's kind of like, you know do your rounds you know and so on or you you speak to your managers and really and your front line and just really listen so as the company gets bigger as it grows and grows in terms of hierarchy how do you ensure that the people that you hire to become managers and senior managers and you know have that those values so that it gets inculcated because you know management is a tough thing yeah um, getting a, a, the right workforce is a tough thing yeah. Right. So the right talent is a big thing in Asia because it's thin. Yeah. Good so, people are hard to come by. So for one, you know, make sure that those qualities. I, I, I look for managers who listen. Right. That's the you know, and, and 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 no one gets it hundred percent correct on the first day. Right. So you 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 you've been working with them and you try to point out opportunities where they could have listened or you could have listened. Right. So. Um, that's the kind of thing you, you work together with them managers don't come pop up just like that you work with them for a while uh, like, like at BFM you know, I've worked for Mira for about 10 years yeah. right? so, and you know, I've, I've seen her listen I've seen the times when she hasn't listened right? so, that's so that we have a conversation about yeah. you know, those kind of things right? so, um, so I think that's the, that's the um, uh, to me it's working with your managers and not just plunking them in I, 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 the, the time I feel the most riskiest ever is to bring someone from the outside to lead your current team. That to me, it's hugely, um, it's, I, I, I do not like doing that. 
Yeah. Uh, so they, because they don't feel the culture. They don't they feel don't the culture. And, so the and, and we've done it before. I've done it before with job. I mean, I've been part of that process in Job Street where we've brought in people from the outside just kind of like to lead a country or lead yeah. this. Yeah. And it, you know, hmm. at the end of the day, if you look at the jobs with management at yeah. the end of the day, they're all yeah. home, they're all homegrown. They're yeah. all in yeah. in house, right? Talent. You know, people we brought from the outside never kind of like truly work out, you know, yeah. you know, that kind of thing. Right? Uh, so I remember I used to work for Reuters and then they brought in after like dozens and dozens of years of just hiring journalists from within the ranks to become CEO. Yeah. Then they hired this American investment banker named Tom Closer. Mm. Then from there, it just went in the complete state of disarray. Mm. <laughs> so sometimes, yes, maybe there's uh, there's a reason for a strategic shift in strategic direction. Yeah. You want, you know, you want someone from coming from a different, different area altogether. But... Um, but I think just in terms of you know it's good to it's good to give first preference to those guys who, who know the culture and so yeah. on right now unless yeah. you are doing you are really trying to change the company you're going for something radical you're going from like Nokia you're going from boots rubber boots to technology right then yeah. then something else gives right? so then the path from um, five people to ten people ten people to thirty people thirty people to fifty people there's 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 teething pains every stage of the journey right mm. from cash flow to hiring to meeting bills to collections to brand equity. Uh, what kind of lessons can you give on those fronts? Um, so, um, what I've what I've learned. What were what, the big milestones, right? The big milestones for me. Well, to me, it's something. Um, there's there's something called. Uh, to me, once a firm gets to a certain size or yeah. a group gets to a certain size, yeah. you need to make it break it down to smaller groups, yeah. to smaller sizes that you can manage, right? So, um, I. I'm, I'm told this story by my father, okay. who was an immigration officer uh, in Singapore. Yeah. Right? He was uh, employed by Colonial Service um, for um, people coming from Indonesia um, to to sell their hawk, their kropo, and everything for the day. Um, in or maybe for a couple, it wasn't a day. It was for about two, three days in Singapore. It spent like two, three days. A ship will come in, and they're all been, you know, everyone will be kind of like ferries will come in. And they want to go to Singapore shores and sell their wares yeah, for about two, yeah. three days, and then yeah. they. But my job, my father's job, to make sure every single one of them gets yeah. back on that sh- on that ferry yeah. back to Indonesia. Yeah. Right? So I remember him t- telling me the stories. He goes, you know, I, it, it, I, I said I can't keep track of every single one of them. So you know what yeah. I did? He says, you know. I, I tried that. I tried this out. I just appointed one of them. I say you, right? And you, you, you. Put all of you go into groups. Okay, so they go groups of about five, five or six, five, five or six people only. Okay, then they appointed one person. You, you. I hold you personally responsible to make sure that these five people come back to the boat in three days' time. If That's you, delegation. <laughs> yeah. If you don't bring them back on this boat yeah. in five days' time, I'm gonna get you, right? You are the one that I'm gonna. De- I'm, you, I'm gonna ban from coming from Singapore. You know, for the rest of your life. You know, so that I, you know, so what you do is you split this, 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 this authority that you have as a immigration officer into even people who are actually the people you are trying to manage. Right? They are the ones that you, know, you appoint a leader amongst them, and you give them accountability, you give them responsibility, you give them the sticks and carrots. Right? Yeah. Well, actually, in this case, just sticks. Right? And say, okay, you, that's that's your that's your job. So, hello and behold, everyone came back on that shit three days later. Right? So, delegation so, of responsibility. But also to teams which are manageable. So, for, yeah. for us, I think at BFM, we are, I always talked about sales. I always talked about breaking people, got groups into groups yeah. of five or six people as much as possible um, to, to manage things. So, you see, you know, the morning run team. Yeah, morning run team, is, you know, it started off with, you know, four, yeah. you know, three, four people. And yeah. then we we're counting up to seven, eight. I think that's already stretching it to a certain extent. Any bigger, then you just have to like, shoot, to split that into another two teams again, right? So most teams are built around sort of four or five people right now in BFM. So that's why I like it. That's why, in a way, I'm, I'm implementing something that was that was implemented in the 1930s or 40s in, yeah. um, in colonial Singapore. Then what about things like size? Because um, obviously BFM is still a, quite a small company it in is, the scheme yeah. of things. Yeah. Uh, 50 people, 60 people, 70 give now. or take 70, right? Mm. And then you've got the companies like, uh, I don't know, ExxonMobil with 200,000 people. Yeah. Um, what is your view on size and growth and, and you know exponential growth? What what do you feel about that? I have no idea about how to manage Exxon. No. Yeah. Not my not part of my sweet suite of skills. As an entrepreneur, how big should one get? I how would, small should one stay? 
Um, I would try to stay small as much as possible. Yeah. I, you know, it's um, it's weird, but I don't believe I, I I don't get satisfaction from seeing a company that's that's big, right? So. Um, BFM is 70 people I feel like okay that's, that's BFM I, yeah. let's pass it to people who may, perhaps maybe can manage 70 people I yeah. can't manage 70 people because an American say right roughly speaking might come in and say well you know hey, look, look I, I run a, a very profitable radio station now let's go and buy one a year for the next five years and we'll be a seven station company by the year whatever whatever it will have yeah. like 10x revenue and 10x profits to me that's doable you buy some yeah. radio stations you yeah. you know you do organic growth right yeah, yeah. you buy some radio stations you can you have one and you then know. you go sideways from there and you do all kinds of things yeah so that's not a problem for me right so yeah. so growing by, by by acquiring something then you know so long as you give you know sort of you are able to like give autonomy and accountability to to team leaders of yeah. those each of those radio stations, yeah. right? So that's not a, that's not a, to me that's not ExxonMobil, right? That's basically you're dealing with a you know uh, 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 quite almost like all right, you know the, you're a special purpose vehicle for you know this radio station, go for it, right? So yeah. that's you build another seventy people there, you build another fifty people here, sixty people there, and then you have team leaders for that, and you split them up. So in a way, it's still very very divisible, right? Um, yeah. So to me, um, so my problem is is that when it comes to like, wow, you have, you know, you have two thousand people, right? Then it gets a bit. Uh, there you have two thousand people all in one uh, one department or one you know so one area or one you know company and like, well, I I wouldn't know how to how to manage that, right? Uh, yeah. I, it's not part of my suite of skills, you know. So. Yeah, you know, you'll never see me running a GLC for that for, the, for that matter. Yeah. because I, I don't know how to I don't have those skills. So would it be true to say that the, you're the kind of, of entrepreneur who likes to grow companies to a certain size, and then keep a, a suite of smaller companies that are highly profitable? Um, you don't want to become a conglomerate. Yeah. So so that's your definition of growth. Yeah. Yeah. So you know going you know for example if you were to say to me Malik you know um, there's a radio opportunity in Indonesia I'll right. go for it right okay. if there's a radio opportunity in Vietnam I'll go for it right yeah. so but but then you build it again but then then you keep it you keep it at that 50, 60 people you have a, you have good country management you have good good um, good you know um, yeah and and so that that becomes and then you talk to one person maybe yeah. maybe his or her team and so on so that's my way of growth and so you know but is it sort of um you know go you know is it sort of vertically integrating so that we're doing everything nah, nah, that that gets a little bit complicated for me yeah um and then you're a tech guy you're a media guy i know that for a fact um and you're very very open to new ideas so how do you read radio? Okay, it's just deep diving to mm. the industry right now. Mm. Radio has been around for over a hundred years. Mm. I, I, I'm not sure whether Marconi is the first guy, but certainly he's been over a century old. And then you got online radio. So, um, as an as an entrepreneur, how do you navigate new technologies versus old technologies? How do you read things? Yeah. Well, where are the markers in the sand? Yeah. So you know, the biggest challenge for radio is yeah. not um, is actually driverless cars. Okay. Right. And that's the and, big opportunity. And grab. No, I think that's the that's the That's the future? No, that's the that's that could be the death of radio that's when you have disruptor. driverless cars. Yeah. Okay. Because you're sitting in a driverless car, what do you do? What are you gonna do? What are you gonna do, Trump? When you're sitting in a driverless car? Reply emails, I guess. Uh, Reply emails, exactly. Right? What yeah. else? Read, sleep. Yeah. Sleep. Watch a video Catch maybe. Mostly, yeah. Watch Play a, a game video, maybe. Yeah. Right? But no, I wouldn't because in the morning I'd be getting ready for work and ah. the last thing I want is to be, you know, lulled into some kind of like <laughs> true. oblivion, yeah. right? Yeah, true. Good. So so that's where I think the the challenge of radio is. And so where people have other things to do. Right now there's a funnel. There's a beautiful funnel where you're in the car, you're stuck in a jam, you're driving yourself to work from you know, from Bano Utama to KLCC, right? You're driving on the road. You can't really text. You can maybe at yeah. traffic lights and things like that. But but then what do you have? You have something called company. So they have switched yeah. on the radio. It's hard yeah. to watch a video as well. Correct. It's hard to to it's hard to do other things. So that's we have that funnel in the morning, in the evening, in some parts yeah. of the afternoon and yeah. so on, right? So that's fine. But when you have driverless cars and you have and you have or, or if if everyone takes Grab for example, then you're sitting at the back. Then you can do your own thing. Then it you, then what happens is that it depends on your mood. In the evenings, you'll be watching a video on your way home, yeah, right? You, sure. you know, no, you not, won't be listening. Forget to radio you. by then. Yeah, yeah. Right? But on your way to work, if we do our jobs well, if we if we do our jobs well, you still would want 
to hear something that connects you to your working life, to your work, to your what you're going to do, the, do, do the thing, right? So if you're a responsible kind of person, you say, you know what, I'm going to work now. I'm going to switch on my, I, I'm already in my work mode. I want to know what's going on. I need to keep up with the news to understand what's going on that impacts me, it makes me, and what I need to talk to my, talk to my team about. So on your way to work, hopefully, even with driverless cars, we still have an opportunity as radio to speak to you either yeah. through the through the car or through your through your app or through your phone doesn't matter. So uh, we, the fact that you want to feel connected to the community, we're able to deliver. Yeah. That. So that's what I'm trying to say is the minus for for the to me the writing is on the wall for the future for radio once driverless cars come in, but we still have. Uh, or, or a bit more diminished role, we still have a role to play connecting you to the community. So if your worst fears are proven correct mm. and um, driverless cars does disrupt radio to its death, right? It might happen, you never know. How does the entrepreneur stay nimble to stay with the times and to make sure that he, is, he or she is not disrupted? Um, you know, one, 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 one possibility. How does one stay nimble? I mean, that's the management lesson here, right? So you could, you know, we, you know, by that time, we we hopefully we're involved in other projects that will yeah. bring this. So, yeah. um, you know, we you know we're going to video now, etc. There might be a different business model for yeah. podcasts and so on. Yeah. Maybe it's a question of curation, but there's also another another possibility, right? Get out before it, before it get, before okay. it dies, right? Okay. So that's the other possibility. That's that's how you be nimble. You say, right now, I. I I, you know, it, it, this this thing is coming. The writing's on the wall. Yeah, sell out. Go, you know, do what John Medeski did, right? Yeah, yeah. So that's that's an interesting notion. So a lot of people, are entrepreneurs, um, they never sell. They, they never build a business for, with a view of selling. Yeah, and I'm one of them. You're one of them. Mm-hmm. Why is that? Because you get the pot of gold, right? I mean, so for some people, the pot of gold is the be all and end all. I mean, you know. Um, it, it, so you, you're not you're, not, you're whether, not a trade sale person. You're not a sell out person. Uh, it depends whether you are. If if Google comes to you now and says, Malay, I'm going to give you fifty million dollars US for Malay for for BFM," mm. you're not going to say no, are you? Of course, I'm going to say no. You sure. you are going to say no. Yeah. Why? Because there's, there is there is something there is something bigger than Google um, here, right? There's something about there's something about about having a part to play in this next phase of Malaysia, right? So that's bigger than. That's much bigger than fifty million dollars in terms of, in terms of value, right? And to me, it's like it's like to me, it's it's that's that's someone's life's work, right? So, it, it can't be. It's like that's what the Mastercard says. It's priceless. Right? So the lesson here is for some for some not all some entrepreneurs, the mission is is the goal, is the vision, uh, the raison d'être is is the the, um, the fulfilling part about doing something which is worthwhile and meaningful to one's life and existence. Yeah. So, give an example. Okay. My club, my first classified is business. Right? Okay. Did you just, feel that passion for the business? Not really. You didn't? Yeah. So that was that was kind of like solving a problem. The passion was in being able to solve a problem. Right? Yeah. But if someone were to say to me, hey, my, you know, car- car- you know, version version three now, right? So you had, you had, you had someone classifies newspapers, and then you had uh, vertical classifies like Job Street and and yeah. Property Guru and iProperty, and then you know, and then your car guys or Carsum, etc. And then you have your carousels coming coming to the, yeah. to the thing, right? Yeah. So, so if if that's the I mean, so carousel to come in and say, hey, you know, like we want to we want to buy car classifiers. Why we just in, in those days? I'm like, yeah, sure, go ahead, yeah. right number, go go for it, right? Because it's it's, it's, it's not part of your fabric. Yeah, but but BFM is different. Media is slightly different, right? Um, I don't think you know uh, you have to offer tong, you know, uh, you know, owner the edge, owner of the edge, yeah. you know, um, uh, the the op- uh, to buy his company. You know, I'm sure he had offers when he was going all out against uh, to mute him. I'm sure that he, yeah. I'm sure he had offers to sort of you know um, to to buy over the edge I'm sure it, yeah, and, and you know and someone in that position will say you know what why I'm not doing this for money man you know I'm not you know I'm doing this for I'm doing, I'm, I'm doing this for the country so, so there's a band of entrepreneurs who never ever sell out because it's just it, it defines them it is at least for me it's it defines why they're on this earth defines I'm not sure about that I think it's more not what it defines us but because there's a special thing about media Right. Why is yeah? Why media though? Cause because you, me, you, you have an impact. You have an impact in sort of playing a part in shaping people's opinions. Right? Well, that's part of the reason why I do this as well. Because yeah. I want to, yeah, right. Yeah. And, and I'm I'm glad that you've done this, you know, with me. Yeah. And we, we do we we do feel a certain purpose doing it. Yeah. I mean, why else would we do it? Yeah. It, it can be quite thankless at times. Sure. 
yeah. right? Yeah. So, so I'm not I'm not sure whether you turn around to say someone like MK or Kirex, right? Would you say you know you are the, the, the you condom, are defined you are defined yeah. yeah you are defined by the, this this industry or yeah. this business that you build. And they clearly uh, do it for the money. I'm not sure. I don't know, right? I, I but, don't know. Yeah, but yeah. I'm sure it, it's not so. You know, it's like you know, with, if if someone to come in and go offer you ten times what the market price is for the thing, you'd be saying, "Oh, yeah, sure." You know. Yeah. Whereas if someone to offer me ten times what the price price of BFM, I'm like, so, do I still have work to do or not? Yeah. Do I still have yeah. work to do in terms of you know, sort of in terms of, you know, what 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 this phase of Malaysia? I, that's I yeah. think there's still work to yeah. do. So. So you, I don't think you're that old, right? You've you've you're a very youthful guy, Malay. You uh, you keep yourself you're very well preserved. Um, Thank you, Trump. <laughs> you always remind that every year. I appreciate that. You do. You know, you've got a full head of hair, and you're, you know, you're, you're not unattractive, right? Um, you can put it that and way. I'm not. I'm not that way inclined. But how much longer does one go? Does does one does one work until one one falls down? Or I mean, uh, what I'm saying is, um, do businessmen ever ever give up the sword? Mm. At least for you. For me, yeah. Um, I think I'm. How much more years? So, for me. How many more years? Yeah. You know, so for me, I you know the, I'm actually not I, I you know in terms of, uh, I'm actually not at hundred percent right now. Yeah. Right. I'm I'm at, you know, seventy percent work, thirty percent yeah. family. Right? Yeah. Or eighty percent work, twenty yeah. percent family right yeah. now. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and the reason for it is I still have young kids. Yeah. Right. But the moment my young youngest, who is twelve years old now. The moment he has his own things to do and has his own life, which is probably in about maybe six, seven years, right? The moment he has that, I'm gonna go ramp up. Are you serious? Yeah. And you're gonna be a different vintage then, Molly. Yeah, I know. I'm gonna ramp up. Yeah. You know, so, but maybe not necessarily in the entrepreneurial space, right? Yeah. Um, but maybe where, wherever I can help with, with, with this, as I said, this phase of Malaysia, right? Yeah. Um, education is a huge thing for me. So, yeah. maybe ramping up, ramping up in that in that sector, right? So. So that's not necessarily as an entrepreneur, yeah. but, but there's someone who, who cares about the education of the, of the kids in this country. Yeah. Right? So that's something. That's something. You know. So I'm, so I'm not sure whether you know, um, you've seen the last of me with, with the, the BFM and, and, and Fi Life as yeah. we call our insurance yeah. entity yeah. is 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 the last thing you'll hear from me, right? So, the other segment of it which is very very interesting, which we haven't really touched on, is your investor side. Mm. Now you um, are you are a very passionate investor. And I think, and I think, correct me if I'm wrong. You are either a real estate guy and or primarily an equities guy. You you know the share market. You analyze stocks. Nothing makes you happier than analyzing the stock and getting the call right. Mm. I don't analyze the stock that hard, Chong. Okay. I just so, go. So for again, so what are the lessons there? Do I, you feel I, it? Yeah, I just go for the. Ma- I just go for the, the. The big macro themes. The big macro themes. Uh, okay. The signals, right? I I, okay. I, the best stocks to, for me to buy are ones which I have experienced. Uh, in some form or another. Give okay. you an example. Okay. Um, I was working for Maxis in um, year two thousand two, right? The the, the um, and I know what Maxis was like. They're, you know, good so company. So Maxis is a telco. It's Maxis a mobile is a telco. telco. Yeah, mobile telco, right? Okay. Great company. Um, you know, established processes. You know, um, ex- good execution and so on. But man, DG was faster, nimbler, under Telenor. Faster, nimbler. We came up with, we designed SMS uh, price cuts. Um, we took a month and a half to design it, pre- prepare the packaging, this and that. Okay, we're gonna, cre- we're gonna reduce our SMS from fifteen cents to ten cents, right? Put it out to market, right? The next day, DG came back with a better offer, five cents, right? The next day. That's not intuitive. That's just price cutting. I know, but what I'm trying to say is that was someone that was nimble. We took a month and a half, two months to figure this out. They did it within a day, right? So what I'm trying to say is, when I was at Maxis, I knew that the the player to the invest in, invest in is actually Digi, right? Okay, right. So that's how I learned. There's some industry experience. So lesson is you invest in what you know. In what you know, what right? So another so another example of that was Yahoo. I was working with Yahoo, and then you know what? There were there were two thousand of us trying to do search word keywords this and that manually, and Google's algorithm was doing it. Just like that, we were fighting against the algorithm. The two thousand people we had Yahoo was fighting against algorithm. Google, you don't buy Yahoo. So when I left Yahoo, I bought Google, yeah. right? So these are the things that for, first is industry yeah, experience. Bloody hell, Google right? would have done a l- bloody well for you, right? Yeah. So it's same way, likewise, right now, yeah. right? So where are we, where uh, as a media person, I know that ninety percent of digital revenues right now in Malaysia are taken up by Facebook and Google. So what did I do? I buy. I got Google already, so I bought Facebook, right? 
So, so these are industry experiences that you know as a player who are the who are the winners right now. Again, I'm in the media industry. I see Netflix. Netflix, wow, over really high valuations and all that. But suddenly, but do, you, do you still buy it fifty times? No, earnings? I don't. Why? Because then I know this game as a media person, right? Now I know that this game, that basically everyone's gonna get, everyone who is in the middle is gonna get arbitrage, Astro, um, you know, even. Yeah, you know, anyone, even HBO, to a certain extent. Yeah, Astro, all the all those guys who are platforms, distribution platforms, are gonna get just you know they're just gonna get um, swiped. Not swiped. No, basically, yeah, they, uh, they're gonna be arbitrage, right? They're, yeah. gonna, they're, they're out of the equation. So, so who do I go for? I go for Disney. Disney has Marvel. It has all the content you want, and they have they own sixty percent of Hulu, right? So what they're going to do? They're going to go direct. They're going to go to direct consumers. They have everything. All they need is that distribution platform, which Astro used to provide them, and now they they can provide themselves. We can subscribe from here. Oh, okay, Geo Target. Da da da. Go go go. Subscribe to Disney, Disney in um in the US. Right. So for the novice equity investor who yeah. does not have the knowledge that you do, yeah, who has not got the industry knowledge that you do, do you outsource the decision to a professional fund manager? Not necessarily. Right. Anathema to some people. Or do you spend the time and, and carve out the, the part of your day to go and analyze stocks and analyze industries? Yeah, I would what is your advice? My advice is do a bit of do not necessarily fund manager. Yeah, you know, go, you know, just you know buy ETFs. You know, do what our our mutual friend Julian Julian Ng says. Go buy ETFs until you learn how to how to do. But this. then, but then there's a, there's a huge time bomb in ETFs if you believe the hyperbole, right? Okay, maybe yeah. So, but but there's there's companies like. That do for well at least go for something which is for passive investing, right? Yeah. So rather than the active managers, you don't know who's going to perform yeah. better, right? Basically, you know, um, you know only twenty percent of fund managers do better. They don't. They're not the same names every year, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, so for me, until you you know let invest in those sort of passive passive type investments until you learn until you get your feet wet until you're a bit more you know sort of. You grow, you know. You start to learn, and you start making little sort of, you know, when you when as you're learning, you have to say, okay, now if I had the gum, if I had the money right now, I would invest in this, and then you know, keep a keep a fairy tale stock portfolio, right? A yeah. fictional stock portfolio, but you do it. Go do yeah. go do it, and say, yeah. say I, I'm buying this, this is this. I have do what Tong does on the edge every every week, right? He has his portfolio. Do that as well. Do be look at your portfolio. Give yourself a hundred thousand ringgit. And figure it out. Try try buy buy the companies and so on. Do that. Right? So learn and and see whether into your intuition slash experience yeah. slash knowledge as you come and grow older yeah. uh, gets there. So play so, play with those things. So if you're thirty one uh, and you're coming in a bit of money because you're got, you're starting to see higher salaries, you don't have a child, uh, you're quite risk um, lenient. Um, do you take a punt and do you take a punt on Bitcoin cryptocurrencies? Mm-hmm. What do you think of those things? Don't buy anything you don't understand. I mean, there was a big Rule buzz. Yeah, there was a big buzz at there was a big buzz at BFM at one point in time, right? Yeah. Uh, amongst the the more tech tech savvy yeah. amongst us, yeah. right? Yeah. Saying, yeah. "Oh, let's buy Bitcoin." Da 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 da. I remember all talk was three thousand bucks or something now. Yeah. No? So you know, uh, and I remember going like going. I remember those guys asking me, saying, "You know, like Malik, are you going to invest in Bitcoin?" I'm like. Yeah, I, I don't. I'm sorry. I really don't understand it. Yeah. Um, I know you mine for this stuff, and I know you yeah. need a lot of electricity to mine for this stuff. But it seems like, uh, what? But at the end of the day, the supply of this stuff is actually something I don't understand. I need to know the supply. Yeah. I know the demand, yeah. but I don't know the supply. Yeah. Where does the supply come from, yeah. right? And so you, and it's like buying. You know, and it does. It's, it's, it's not generating a. It, it's not generating any operational income. You buy equities in a company. You buy Google. And every year, Google says, "All right, you know, I made, you know, I made X billion dollars dollars of profit. I'm gonna, you know, and and that's adding up to my share price. You know, so but that profit, there is a real profit with Bitcoin. It doesn't generate anything. Like Warren Buffett says, what does gold generate? It's yeah. just a store of value. It's just a place to. So you're not a gold guy. No, I'm not a gold guy either. Yeah, yeah. I, I, so I, I believe that. I think I need to buy something that is productive that that creates income." Right and companies create income. Good companies create good income. Warren Buffett also said that when everybody is uh, going zig, yep. you go zag. You yep. contrary. Yep. So to the con- I can understand why there's a lot of confusion in there because everyone now is so negative on Bitcoin and, and cryptocurrencies. Some people might just say, "Hey, look, maybe now's the time to buy." Nope, don't, you so don't think you don't think so? No, he doesn't. No, no. Um, Buffett doesn't say. He, he doesn't zig. talk about cryptocurrencies. No, he, he doesn't. He doesn't he talks say about going against the herd, though. Yes, right. But not no. But he do, he doesn't zigzag. He doesn't go zig and zag on Bitcoin. He doesn't go zig and zag when people go zag and he goes zig on 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 gold, right? He, he's he's a staunch anti-gold guy. 
So yeah. he do, he goes for equities, right? At yeah. the end of the day, or, or you know, convertible debt into equities, that kind of thing, right? So yeah, yeah so there was a moment, there yeah. was a moment in time, right? Yeah. So there was a moment right now. Look at Amazon, right? Do you believe Amazon ma- on a macro thing is a, is a great company? I think so. Yeah. I mean, so, look at the web so services, right? Crazy. Go, go buy Amazon tomorrow, right? One thousand six hundred US. They were they were trading about two thousand plus. You know, just about the US yep. per share is mad. Buy one lah. You can afford, you, you can buy, you can afford at least ten chuan that, that I know today in your bank account, right? right? So, so you know it's at two thousand six. It used to be two thousand something. If you believe in Amazon, you believe in Amazon is taking the taking over the world. You, yeah. know, you believe in Jeff Bezos. You know, go for yeah. it. Right. Well, they, There's another phenomenon there as well. He's a founder entrepreneur, right? Yeah. And founder yeah. entrepreneurs don't mess with. There are right? very few that you know. They'll they, mess with them. Yeah. Bill Gates was one of them. Yeah. Uh, Steve Jobs was one of them. Then people and you know Netflix. Uh, Reed right. Hastings was Reed one. Hastings, is is yeah. one one of yeah. them. So don't bet against them. And he's still young. Yeah. Um, Jeff Bezos. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Incredible. Well, hey, hey, buddy, thank you for for doing this. It's been a real honor and privilege. And I think what you said this will resonate with many young people. Yep. And, um, and yeah, it's been a pleasure to work with you, Chuang. We've been working together since. Yes, right. Yep. That's so right. you know, yeah, yeah, interesting for you to go what on this it? project. For well, twelve years now, right? Is it eleven years? Yeah. I've known you. Ten years. Yeah. It's been a real inspiration, Malik. Thank you, mate. Likewise. Thank you. Cheers. Thanks, Chuang.